Oh, great to see you. I was, I was standing in the, I, I didn't get to talk to everybody before. I got to talk to a few of you before. And uh, I was just noticing we have several new people here tonight. And so we're really glad you're here. If a friend invited you or if you just walked in or you saw it on Instagram or whatever it was, uh, we're just really glad you're here. I'm Paul. I'm the pastor here in our new We Church in Edinburgh. And um, Anthony liked that. I used a Scottish word. Yep, that was it. It's a We Church. And, uh, and so uh, welcome in. As of tonight, we are going to be meeting weekly. And uh, so no more... <laughs> No more guessing about when Take Hold Church is having church, all right? We'll be here every week at 5 o'clock. Great opportunity to invite people. At the end tonight, uh, I'm going to let you know what we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks. In fact, it'll come up during my message. And uh, we've also got a gift for all of you tonight. We're going to be doing something in the lead up to Easter. All together, a season of prayer emphasis that we'd love for you to participate in and join us in. And uh, we'll all be praying the same thing every day for 40 days leading up to Easter. And so excited to, uh, to share that with you tonight. My wife is not here. We've been in the States for a couple weeks and uh, back. And it's, it's nice to be back and to say I'm back home. Uh, it's after being here for a little over a year. I was missing home. And uh, I wish it wasn't so windy at home, but um, I'm really still still glad to be here uh, back in the land of good coffee and, and all the other things that we have in this city and back with all of you. And so great to be with all of you. I told you that tonight I would be giving you a word, a word that I hope will carry through this entire year and maybe belong for our church. So I didn't start off the first Sunday of the year with a word. Because as I said, I need a minute to take a breath in January. All right, all, everyone's making resolutions in January and then they flame out like in 10 days. I would be totally one of those people. So I, I have to take a breath and I have to think about myself and my life. And I love doing that in the New Year's. And then I think about the year ahead. And I really believe now that for several weeks, God has given me a word that I believe will encourage you as we go forward throughout this year. But let me ask you a question. When was the last time you had a really good idea? I mean, when was the last time you had a great idea? If you've taken a shower, you've had an idea. Maybe not a good idea, but you've had an idea, right? I don't know about bath people. I'm not a bath person. To me, bath people probably don't have good ideas. They're just sitting there stewing, just kind of just letting life go by. But I, I love when a good idea comes, however it comes, whether I'm walking through the park or, or running or I'm in the car, or but at the shower, it, it, it seems to happen. I've had this idea, this thought, like I would love it if all females would have like a projector that comes from their forehead and lets all of us guys know what you're really thinking. I would like my wife to be the beta test on this, okay? Like, I'll, I'll give this to Elon Musk and say, please, this is what the next chip needs to do. Just let, just please come up with something. I would love to occasionally be able to relive any, some glory days. Were any of you like just amazing footballers when you were younger? Just anybody, or you played in the States, it was basketball. Uh, when I was six years old, I scored three goals in one game. It was legendary. It's the most amazing thing in my entire athletic career. I peaked at six years old. I would love to go back and just relive that moment where I sort of accidentally kicked the ball off my foot and it accidentally dribbled in past another five-year-old who just, I just totally blew him away. Like that would be awesome. Love to be able to go back and to relive the glory days, like time travel. That seems like that seems like that would be kind of a good idea. I don't know. I mean, there's some things I'd like to go back and see and experience from my own life, maybe from history, whatever it, it might be. That would be awesome. A lot of times you have a good idea and you, you get out of the shower, you get to work, you get out of the car or whatever it is, and you just kind of think to yourself, you know what? Somebody should do that. Somebody should really do that. Or maybe you think about something else that someone else has done. You feel like they took your idea. Like, yeah, I, you know what? I should have said something sooner. I should have gotten that patent. I should have done whatever it, it may have been. Somebody should do that. If we could go to scripture tonight, we're going to be, I'm going to be telling you one of my very favorite stories from the Bible. 
And I had never, I've never preached a message on it before. Just recently been studying it, and I feel like God's even shown me some, some new things in it. From 1 Samuel chapter 13, which I'm going to talk about, and then the scripture is going to be from 1 Samuel 14. We've just got a couple verses we'll look at tonight, and they'll be on the screen here in just a second. But as some of you would know, if you've been around the Bible at all, if you've been around the church at all, the very first king of Israel is a guy by the name of King Saul. Why did they pick Saul? Well, God told the prophet Samuel to pick him, but also because he was head and shoulders taller than everybody else. I mean, he projected strength. He looked the part. So even if you don't know the scriptures, I want you to know it's okay. We're going to explain the stories and what we're going to start doing next week is we're going to start going just through Old Testament stories. And here's what I'm going to try to do as we just kind of march through the Old Testament. I'm always going to try to show you where Jesus is in the story, even if he's not technically in the story, how the Bible is showing us where Jesus is in the story. I'm also going to always try to respect what I'm going to call the fair questions. Next week is creation. Do Christians really believe that a Hebrew poem describe how God created the earth? I think that's a fair question. Do Christians really believe that God spoke the world into existence and that he did it all in less than a week? I think it's a fair question. Those are a couple of examples. So I'm going to try to always address the fair questions as we go from things like creation to Noah and the flood to David and Goliath and on and on. We'll take breaks in this, but we're going to pretty much just march through the scriptures and we're going to be letting you know each week in email what verses you can read to be prepared ahead of time. All right, so that you can read, you can follow along, you can test me, you can ask questions later. We'll always respect the, the fair questions, all right? So King Saul, first king of Israel. And in the Old Testament, a lot of times, there are these tribes that harass Israel. One of them comes up over and over again. They're called the Philistines. And this, in this particular season with King Saul, the Philistines are just constantly harassing, raiding, taking from the people of Israel just over and over again. So Saul gets an army together of about 3,000 Israelites. He puts himself in charge of 2,000. He puts his son Jonathan in charge of 1,000. And then Jonathan, we're gonna, you're going to hear a lot more about him tonight and get some things about his personality. Jonathan, with his 1,000, decides to attack the Philistines and wins an amazing victory, a shocking victory. And so the Philistines then decide they are not going to allow this to happen ever again. So the Philistines get 30,000 soldiers, 30,000 chariots, a cavalry of 6,000 cavalry and horsemen. And then the Philistine army is described in 1 Samuel 13 as being like the sand on the seashore. You win one victory and now you've got to fight against the sand on the seashore. So what do the soldiers do that Saul and Jonathan had gotten together now that they see this massive army that's come against them? They run. And I mean, this is probably the right idea. They flee to the mountains, to the caves. The scriptures say they hide behind the bushes, which is kind of a funny comment to me. It's like a bunch of third graders are now playing hide and seek. I mean, these guys are so afraid of this army that's come against them. And King Saul does something different than what God has asked him to do. He actually, on his own terms, on his own time, decides that he is going to sacrifice to God and ask God to give him some kind of victory or some kind of way forward. He's doing it completely on his own terms. He's panicked. And because of that panic, according to the scriptures, the prophet Samuel has to come and tell Saul, listen, you're king, but then that's it. God is taking the royal line away from your family because you have disobeyed a specific instruction from God. Saul's panic in trying to take things into his own thing in his own hands and do things his own way causes him to lose the royal line. And when we do that in our lives, when we try to take things into our own hands and force the hand of God, the scriptures say that sin is crouching at your door. So here's what you need to know. Saul and Jonathan are down to six men. He has lost the favor of God. And there's another very practical 
historical problem. Nobody has any weapons. The scriptures say there are only two swords in all of Israel. Saul has one and Jonathan has the other. The Israelites have no blacksmiths. The Philistines have all the armor, they have all the weapons, and they're outnumbering these guys at least 30 to 1, and that doesn't count the sand on the seashore. But then there's Jonathan. I don't know how old Jonathan is at this stage. He's his father's son, and he has an idea. Jonathan wakes up his armor bearer, and he says to him, how about you and me go pick a fight? Now, his armor bearer would be another young man assigned to him. It's completely ceremonial because he also doesn't have any weapons and he doesn't have any armor. We don't know if Jonathan had armor. We know that Saul did. Maybe Jonathan does. Maybe he doesn't. If he does, he's the only man outside of his father to even have armor. And Jonathan says to his armor bearer, I have an idea. Let's go attack the entire garrison of the Philistines. Now, history would tell us that would be about 40,000 soldiers. And oh, by the way, the Philistines have the high ground. So in Israel, you have these wadis, these narrow ravines. And then there's kind of this, these cliffs on each side in this particular area called Michmash. And the Philistines have the high ground on both sides. They're encamped on both sides of the ravine. I don't know if they're evenly split or what, but... Let's say they are, and there's 20,000 on each side. And Jonathan's like, it's going to be fine. Let's go attack. And oh, by the way, we're not going to try to sneak in and just cause trouble. We're actually going to announce ourselves. Like walking through the ravine, we're going to shout up at these guys and basically pick a fight. If they come down the cliff, then we'll deal with that. If they invite us to climb up, then we will climb up and fight. I'm telling you, one of my favorite stories, and here's how it goes. 1 Samuel 14, 6. Jonathan said to the young man carrying his armor, come, let's cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will work for us because the Lord is not limited to saving by many or by a few. I mean, is he absolutely crazy? Let's go do something. And then maybe God will do something. I love the phrase from this scripture. Maybe, God, maybe the Lord will work for us. He's not limited to saving by many or by a few. What has Jonathan just said to his armor bearer? Perhaps, perhaps God will act. Perhaps God will act. I'm calling this message the perhaps of God. And I don't know what word you may have been expecting, but I'm betting it wasn't this one. The word that I want to put in front of you and that I want you to remember throughout this year and perhaps beyond is the word perhaps. What does Jonathan say? Perhaps God will act. Our Lord's not limited to save. Our God cannot be constrained. It doesn't matter how many we are. It doesn't matter how many they are. It doesn't matter that there's only one sword and maybe one little bit of armor between the two of us. It might just be that God wants to win a victory. It might just be that God wants to do a miracle. It might be that we get a front row seat and maybe even get to participate in the impossible. Listen, Jonathan would not yet know the Holy Spirit that God gives to people who believe on Jesus Christ that we have access to on this side of the resurrection. Jonathan wouldn't know that. What Jonathan would know is that this is the same God who delivered his people from Egypt. This is the same God that parted the sea so that they could walk right through it. This is the same God that brought down the walls of, Jer of Jericho after the people marched around for seven days. He's the same God. That's all that Jonathan knew. Jonathan would know the, the God who 
allowed Samson to beat these Philistines off in battle after battle, time and time and time again. He's the same God. And Jonathan knew that in spite of our best efforts, the purposes of God will stand. He is king. He cannot be shaken. He cannot be restrained. He cannot be moved. Whether by many or by a few, perhaps our God will act. He will get the victory no matter what happens. Perhaps. Now, I don't know about you, but two of us and gets 40,000 and one sword between the two of us perhaps leaves a very uncomfortable door open. Perhaps is this might not work in the way that we hope it will. Perhaps it's almost Jonathan saying, maybe God will do something and maybe not. I think he really believed that God would do something. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But isn't it way easier to believe in God's glorious future for people who believe on him than our difficult present circumstances? It's way easier to believe in afterlife and living with God forever and ever than it is to believe that he can handle my mess every single day. When was the last time you tried something that had no guarantee of success? When was the last time you had an idea that you thought, you know, that'd be really cool, but that might not work? When was the last time you tried something that, to be honest, had a better chance of failure than success? Maybe you thought to yourself, man, somebody should do that. Somebody else should do that. Someone with more education, someone with more resources, someone with more experience. Can I just ask you about that idea for just a moment? Can I ask you about that dream, that thing that you really want to happen, but you've put it off and put it off and put it off, and now you're not even sure? Can I ask you about that? What are you afraid of? Are you afraid of failure? Listen, we need to stop allowing our identity to be defined by moments of failure. I have failed many times in my life. If Angela were here, she would tell you. She might would just come. No, she wouldn't come up. But I have failed many times in my life as a husband, as a son, as a father, my boys can tell you, as a pastor, as a leader, as a friend. But can I tell you something? I am not a failure. Because I know how God defines me in Scripture. Because I have put my faith and trust in Jesus, I am an adopted son of God, an heir with him. The Scriptures call me more than a conqueror. I really like that one. I'm a victorious victor. I have failed in my life, but because of Jesus, I'm not a failure. That's not what identifies me. What stops you from taking action on that idea, on that dream? What stops you from moving forward? God has planted the thought, the dream, or the vision. He's shown you the need. What is stopping you? Maybe it's what will other people say? I'd have no idea. But they will probably talk about you behind your back. I mean, I will probably talk about you behind your back, depending on what the idea is. I mean, it might just really be. People are going to say you're crazy, maybe. They might call you irresponsible, they, they, which is their way of saying, you know, why can't you just be happy being settled and dealing with good enough here like the rest of us. People will make assumptions about you. You will be misunderstood, but you don't answer to those people. And your bold faith and obedience might just be the example they need. Oh, someone ought to do something. Can I tell you? I had this phrase I started saying to Angela before we decided to sell our stuff from the States and move here to start a church in Edinburgh. Last couple of trips we were here, I would look at Angela and I'd say, you know, I know that we could, but that doesn't mean that we should. I think the first time I said it, she looked at me and said, we could what? Well, we could move here. We could maybe start a church. And we just kind of both, yeah, we, yeah, we, we could, but, but that doesn't mean that we should. I should have known. I should have known because, friends, if God has equipped you with could, then you are probably the person who should. If God has equipped you with could, then you are the person who should. Perhaps God will act. 
perhaps is a very uncomfortable word, until you realize that success, particularly by other people's standards, is not the end result. God holds the future. It's up to him what happens. Success is obedience. There's a lot of people who postpone the dreams, the wishes, even the things that God has put in their heart by saying things like, you know what? My yes is on the table. I, I, I believe in God. My yes is on the table. You know, some people live their whole lives with their yes on the table and they never put their yes on the road. Jonathan has turned to his armor bearer. You and me against 40,000. You up for this? Let's go. Here's the thing about being an armor bearer. He's not protected. If this doesn't go well, and you guys have the opportunity to explain who you are, Jonathan is the king's son. They will probably hang on to him for leverage. They've got no reason to hang on to the armor bearer. If you're the armor bearer, you're most likely dead. So what is his response to Jonathan about you and me against 40,000? Look at this. Look what he says without hesitation. And his armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. I love that. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. And so, really? I mean, you've got less chance of making it than he does, and he really doesn't have that much of a chance. And you're with him? Well, you better believe it. Do all that's in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. This armor bearer is willing to lay down his life for Jonathan. And what caused these two guys to make this move? I mean, this is crazy, Right? What would cause them to make this move? I really believe that Jonathan had a clear directive from God. I really believe that he had an idea put on his heart from God, go and attack. However the idea came, it came from him. Jonathan knew he discerned it. What will happen? I have no idea. Hence the perhaps. How is this going to turn out? I have no idea. Will we win? I really can't tell you. And why would Jonathan and his armor bearer move forward? There's two things I want to give you. The first is this. Jonathan got to the point where he could no longer do nothing. Have you ever gotten to the point where you've seen something, whether it's in your mind's eye or you've physically seen it and you believe somebody should do something? Have you ever gotten to the point where you become convinced you are the person and you've gotten to the point where you said, I can't do nothing? I'm not sure the grammar of that. Please don't check me. But if you ever gotten to the point where you would say, I can't do nothing, what Jonathan could not do was just continue to sit there, hiding in the cave. There are lives at stake. Some of you are sitting in a season where it is starting to be painful for you to do nothing. You are stuck. And you're not the kind of stuck that motivational speakers talk about where it's like, I can't stand driving in this job every single day. I can't stand taking the bus here every single day. I got to finish this academic pathway. I got to finish the degree. I just should do the thing. But you just feel absolutely stuck. No, this is the kind of stuck where you are feeling absolutely crushed. You've got to do something or this, is going, this burden is going to crush you. Some of you in your lives right now, you are just hiding out in the cave. And every day the darkness gets thicker and the panic and the anxiety are getting worse. It's because you know you are no longer doing what you're supposed to be doing with your life. And you can't keep pushing this off. And it's not always the case, but most of the time, new ground and new territory means a change of position or even a change of place. How do you deal with those things? How do you deal with moving out of the neighborhood, moving out of the building? How do, you, how do you deal with actually changing your place, changing your position, changing what you do for a living, if that's something that God has put on your life? How, how do you deal with those transitions? You may have had a good run at that job. You may have had a good season. How do I move on from this place that I love? Let me tell you some things, some things I've learned along the way. First of all, thank God for that place. Thank God, bless that. Thank God for the growth you've experienced, the friends you've made, the provision, and trust that he will do it again. Listen, our lives can get cluttered by hanging on to things 
too long. And when that happens, you can't give your heart and soul to anything. This is tough, but you might have to let some people go in your life. Listen, God used them in your life for a season. They will always be significant in your life. They were with you in a really significant season. You may not have survived those days without them. You may have laughed together. You may have cried together. You may have grieved together. You may have suffered together. And you know that if you lose proximity, things are going to look really different. And I just tell you, you need to bless that. You need to take some time and thank God for that. And with tears filled with love and gratitude, you need to move forward into what is possible. Or better yet, maybe you're moving forward into what is impossible. Something only God can bring about. Here's the second thing I love about Jonathan. Jonathan knew it wasn't his reputation on the line. He didn't say like, maybe we'll win and people will think we're awesome. No, he said, perhaps God will act. Maybe the Lord will work for us. Jonathan put God's reputation on the line. The perhaps of God can be wholeheartedly trusted if you make whatever you are doing about him and his purposes, not about you. Why? Why should I make this move? Why should I take this leap of faith? Because your perhaps is most likely not for you. Your perhaps may be someone else's only hope. Your perhaps is going to meet someone else's need. Your perhaps may help someone else come to faith and find salvation in Jesus. No one ever took the next hill by knowing why, by asking why. They asked, why not? Do I get to know what it would look like? God, would you just like, have a screen come out of my forehead that I could see and show me what things are going to look like if I move forward a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. And you know what the screen would say? God would say, you know what? Here's here's what I'm going to put on the screen for you. You're not ready to see this yet. You can't handle it. Just move forward with me one step at a time. Do I get to know what it will look like? No. Hence, perhaps. All right, so I I guess it's only fair that I tell you what happened, right? So Jonathan and his armor bearer, Jonathan says, you ready? Let's go. And so they go. And they yell out at the Philistines. They walk into the ravine, they yell out, and they just pick a fight. And this place, if you were to Google the Wadi of Michmash, you would see this. I mean, and the scriptures say they literally had to climb up on, with, on their hands and feet. Like they're just climbing up. The Philistines could have taken them out right away. But they must have thought, let's have a little bit of fun with these guys. I mean, there's one sword. There's two of them. There's all of us. And the scriptures say that Jonathan and his armor bearer killed 20 Philistine soldiers. As soon as they got to the top, they began to fight. And however they did it, they killed 20 Philistine soldiers. The the battle ranged over less than a half a hectare of land. And then something happened. All the Philistines went into every man for himself mode. And they began to fight each other. And the Bible says that God shook the earth. And as they begin to kill one another in all the chaos, the soldiers hiding in the cave with King Saul decide, oh, let's go join the battle. And so they go join the battle. And I don't know over how long this took, but the scriptures also say the soldiers that had fled to the the mountains and the caves and the guys hiding behind the bushes, I want to see how they popped up behind the bushes. They say, yeah, okay, let's go get it. They still don't have weapons. But now they're convinced they are going to run forward into this battle. And they fight and they fight. They're still outnumbered more than 12 to 1, but they are fighting against the enemy. Can I just encourage you with something? If you take a leap of faith, your faith and obedience will bring others alongside of you. People will come out of hiding. They will rush to the battle because you took that first inspiring step. And the whole thing gets summarized in 1 Samuel 14 by the scripture says, the Lord saved 
Israel that day. What gave Jonathan such confidence? He was confident when it comes to saving his people and advancing his purposes, his kingdom, God cannot be restrained and he is mighty to save. For his purposes to be accomplished, God will always act. We don't always get to know what it looks like, but he will always act. We're going to talk about this story in depth in a few months, so I don't want to give the whole thing away, but a lot of you have heard of the story of the shepherd boy David that goes and fights the Philistine champion called Goliath. Why weren't the people of Israel fighting? Why would nobody go against Goliath? Well, I mean, nobody had a sword. And he's massive. And the guy in front of him is massive. And they're both fully armed. And then a shepherd boy named David shows up with a snack from home for his brothers who are part of the army. He says, what's going on? And why isn't anybody taking down this guy? And David decides he would do it. He has a conversation with the king. The king offers him a sword. David says, no, my God can handle this with just what I've got on me. I just need to walk to the creek for a second. I'll be right back. And he uses his slingshot to kill a giant. That same David would write this later on, Psalm 37, 5. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. How do you know what it's going to look like? I have no idea what it's going to look like. I don't know what this church will look like a year from now. But I know that for his purposes, for his kingdom come and his will be done, he will act. So I don't think you can buy this word at the store that has all the inspiring sayings on it. I don't think you can walk in anywhere in Edinburgh and probably nowhere in Scotland or wherever you're from. I don't think you can walk in and say, you know what, I, I want the plaque that just says, maybe, perhaps, but with God. Perhaps means anything can happen. The impossible can happen. Friends, I want to build a church on perhaps. What does that mean? It means we're going to try some stuff. We're going to try some things that may or may not work. I'll be honest, I've been praying about something for a couple of weeks. Even my wife is a little uncertain about I can promise you if, if God says this is what we need to do, and I'm, I've, I've got to pray about this for a, a minute, I can promise you there's not another senior pastor on planet Earth that will be doing what we're doing here. Promise you. So I need a minute to pray about perhaps, okay? And I'm going to want you to come with me. But can I tell you, I don't want all the ideas to come from here. I want all the ideas to come from people full of faith, full of prayer, willing to bet it all on God and see what he might bring about for the sake of the people in this city who don't know him. Let's build a church on perhaps. And I, I know that there are a few of you in here who are our friends who come and you have told us that you don't believe in Jesus. You don't believe in this the way that we do. And that's totally okay. You are welcome to belong here before you ever believe. I'm going to continue to teach and preach wanting you to believe in Jesus. I believe it is necessary for salvation. I believe Jesus is the way, the only way, the only truth, the only life, the only way to get to God, the only way to experience eternity with him. But even more than that, the only way to experience what he has for you in this life right now. You are welcome, more than welcome, to belong here before you believe. I want to ask you if you would just do me this one favor. Would you just meet me at perhaps? Would you just meet me at what if it's true? What if God sent his only son because he loves me? What if God is not just so far off what if God is actually near and he knows me and he cares about me? 
and he sent Jesus to die on the cross and be risen from the dead for me. What if it's true? Would you just meet me at perhaps and come back? Now I can say come back every week. So God laid something on my heart. I've been praying about over this talk as I prayed and studied over this talk. I'll be honest, I love this story. I'd never taught it before, so I'd never like prayed over it before. And God showed me Jesus in the story as a way I have never seen. And as often as I share a story, even from the Old Testament, I'm always going to be looking for him. Think of this for a moment. The armor bearer is willing to lay down his life for Jonathan. My friends, those of you that have put your faith and trust in Jesus, can I tell you something? You have an armor bearer. He has already laid down his life for you. And his name is Jesus. He has promised to never leave you or forsake you. He is with you and for you. His kingdom is advancing. And he is inviting you in. If there's a dream, if there's a wish, if there's a hope that God's put on your heart, if you're the one who could, then you're probably the one who should. And he will never leave you alone. He will be with you every step of the way. He won't show you what it's all going to look like, but for his kingdom and for his purposes, I guarantee you, he will act. I'm just going to pray for a moment. Would you bow your heads with me? Sam's going to sing a song, and I'm going to come back up here in just a moment. A couple really special things to share before we get out of here tonight, but before we get to that point, we just want to continue in worship. I want to encourage you, child of God, if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, you respond to this song, to this word, however he leads you. Sing it to him. Maybe you need a moment. We just want to carve out space for you to be able to pray for the thing that you know that has been in your mind, in your heart, maybe for days, maybe for weeks, maybe for months, maybe for years. And maybe it's time that you believe in the God of perhaps. And every time we gather, I'm always going to give an opportunity for those of you that have been belonging here, and every single one of you do. There's not a person who can't walk into this room from anywhere in the city and beyond who don't belong in this building. But if you're here and you've been belonging, but you've not yet believed, maybe tonight is the night for you. Maybe tonight is the night where you say, you know what? I believe in the whole thing. That Jesus came, that he lived, that he died for my sins and my place, that I might spend eternity with him. If you're here tonight and you want to believe on Jesus, just a few minutes, in just a few moments, I'm going to invite one of our one of our team to be down at the front. I want to encourage you to come and pray with them, speak with them. We're going to carve out some more space here in just a few moments for that to happen. Keep that in your heart. As we sing and worship, the same God that delivered Jonathan and his armor bearer, he's the same God available to us tonight. God, have your way, your way in this place. You have permission. Holy Spirit, come do the unplanned, do the unexpected in our hearts and lives. You're the only one who can. In Jesus' name.